Okay, good. Right. Good morning. Um, it is great to, uh, well, I'm, I'm um, Stefan Dörkon, I'm here um, uh, very pleased uh, to, to, uh, to see you all, and this room is packed, and I know we have overflow rooms. This, uh, in terms of registrations, this was definitely the biggest conference we've had with close to 500 people registered and over the days. There's not 500 people in the room, we know people come and go a little bit uh, as well. Um, but it's great to see so many uh, people here, so much diversity in the room as well. Um, and it's um, an absolute pleasure for me to be able to uh, introduce Rachel Glenister here to give the keynote of our conference this year. Um, Many of you, if not all, know Rachel Glenister uh, through her enormous reputation as someone who's been working very hard to try and to get um, evidence used in policy-making circles. Um, um, she's been, uh, until quite recently, been the executive director of, of J-PAL, uh, working from uh, Boston uh, and from MIT, and then... Um, she uh, took on a job um, which is uh, very familiar to myself uh, recently and I'm uh, an absolute pleasure uh, to see her now in action inside DFIT and trying to um, keep the flame of evidence uh, um, uh, going and also trying to actually uh, intensify it and make it a bit hotter in the place there around uh, evidence. So um, we have um, a session until one o'clock. Uh, Rachel will talk for about an hour, uh, maybe a little bit less, uh, a little bit more. I'll keep an eye out on that. But we want to have plenty of time for your questions um, and start thinking about them early on because then we're going to do uh, collecting questions uh, and, and, and hopefully we'll have a, a really good discussion uh, on the topic. So, uh, without much more ado, um, please welcome Rachel Glenn to the stage. Uh, great to be working at DFID uh, now, um, especially um, as Stefan's uh, important work there has, has raised the profile of the chief economist position. Um, so I'm grateful for him every day that they expect the chief economist to have words of wisdom. So I'm going to talk uh, about evidence in policy making. Um, if I can move it on. Oh, yeah. Maybe not. Yes. <laughs> So why do evidence-based policy, so let me, let me go, here's the outline. So I'm gonna talk about why do evidence-based policy making and how to do it, and then some implications for researchers, uh, uh, for research and researchers, then briefly talk about policy as a career in case any of those in the room are interested in, in that, and then a plea uh, from the academics in the community uh, to make this process better. So, Starting off with, why is it a good idea to do evidence-based policy? Well, the main answer to that is we are, in most of the countries we're working in, we are very, very far from the production possibility frontier. So, you know, a classic um, view of an economist of, you've, you know, you can spend money on improving education, improving learning, or you can spend it on other things, and there's kind of a trade-off between these two things, um, but we're kind of way, way below where we could be in terms of uh, delivering for the amount of money that the economy has. And which means that if you just improve, uh, sort of technically improve the way you deliver education in many countries, you could do that without spending very much more and get you much closer to the production possibility frontier. Maybe you want to give a little bit of extra money to you know, provide uh, the training to help the teachers get there. But you've already got the schools, you've already got the teachers, they're just teaching in a very bad way. This is what the evidence is suggesting. And therefore, you can move from where we are to a much better, higher level of learning without that much trade-off um, in, uh, you know, against other spending. So, you know, so I'm going to run through a couple of examples of just how big an effect we can have as researchers or as policymakers in terms of using evidence to improve outcomes. So this is a project done by um, some 
uh, some previous colleagues of mine um, working with the Indian government, uh, and Clement, I think, is at, uh, here at the conference too. And it's looking at the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme in India, which is a $6 billion program and reaches 33 million uh, beneficiaries. And the evaluation of this was looking at how to improve the transfer of money from, from the federal government to the people. So this is uh, where people are given pay for working. They guarantee, poor people are guaranteed the opportunity of work in, uh, in, in their village and, and then they will be paid for that work. And the old system was, you know, once, once they had uh, done this work, the, the, the information that they'd done this work went from the panchayat to the block to the district to the state, and then the state sent the money from the state to the district to the block to the panchayat, and ran through an awful lot of bureaucrats' hands as it did so, and a lot of money got lost at every stage in that process. And the very, very simple reform was simply to say, we're going to have a system where we transfer the money directly from the state to the panchayat, right? And it goes through less hands and therefore less money uh, gets lost. And so they did an RCT uh, with, you know, I think 900,000 people were in the RCT. Um, and they found that there was a, they, there was a reduction in spending on this program of 24% with no fall in the numbers of people getting the benefit. And what I love about this study is they also measured that the bureaucrats in these treatment areas were poorer as a result of this reform, which kind of really shows that you're getting some reduction in leakage. So, so you know, if you're talking about 24% improvement on a program of $6 billion, that's why you need to do evidence-based policy making. Because, uh, as I'm going to say, you know, not everything always works, but kind of that paid for all of our work ever, um, that reform. <laughs> so so here's, another, here's another example. Um, so this is mass distribution of, of, of free bed nets. And as you may know, there was a big debate uh, many years ago about, you know, should you be giving bed nets for free or should you pay for them? And there was a series of studies that looked at whether um, if you charge for bed nets, do people, uh, you, you know, does that help improve the use of the bed nets? So if you give them for free, do they get used as fishing nets or do people actually hang them up? And, they, and there was this big perception that we needed to charge for things because it, it was important to, for their use. And... That research very clearly showed that charging was just reducing the number of people who got the bed nets and didn't do anything to improve their uptake. And I wouldn't necessarily say as a result, but kind of coincidentally, and I think there was a lot of use of that evidence in the debates, you see a massive increase in the free distribution of bed nets. So these mass distribution of free bed nets just happened across the continent of Africa where there was, um, where there was a lot of, of malaria. And you see massive decreases in the amount of malaria. And there has been modeling to suggest that most of that decrease came because of the increase in bed nets. So um, this, is, uh, this was a, um, a health study, um, BAT, et al, 2015. And, you know, you can see this kind of very close um, uh, coincidence between where there were increase in bed nets and where there was a degree, decrease in malaria. Again, trying to put a magnitude on that, 450 million fewer cases of malaria and 4 million fewer deaths. So, you know, there's been a, a discussion about uh, you know, some of this small, careful work is small and not really, you know, having big effects. Well, you know, I'll take four million fewer deaths. Thank you. Um, so, so the pushback to some of this kind of technical work on we can get to the production possibility frontier, there's important technical things that we can give, we can provide uh, advice on is, but it's all about politics. It's all a complicated political bargain. You know, your technical solutions as academics aren't really going to contribute because it's all stitched up in politics. You know, nothing's going to change. 
Well, except when it does, because, you know, I just gave you some examples of where it does actually change. But, but there's also some important work going on about uh, politics, which I think is really exciting and suggesting that some of the narratives we have about African politics is a little bit too pessimistic. So this is some work that um, a colleague of mine, a co-author of mine, Kate Casey, did, and I'll show you some follow-up work to it. So this is, this is the ethnic composition of Sierra Leone and the voting uh, in Sierra Leone. Um, I think this is from the 2012 election, but it, actually it's maybe the 2007 election, this, this data is. So you'll see that in the north, West, you have predominantly the Tem Tem Temne uh, ethnicity. In the South, you predominantly have the Mende ethnicity. And the voting patterns at national elections are very, very closely correlated with that ethnic split. So, you know, the, you know, the classic response is then, it's all about ethnicity, nobody cares about policy, and so it's very hard to get change. People are just going, you know, it's a clientistic based system and you know nobody cares about about these technical solutions that you academics can come up with well yes and no so we did an experiment where we provided additional information to voters on their candidates by holding debates between candidates um, and then distributing them and screening those in a random uh, selection of polling centers. And we find that people actually change their vote. Five percentage points of the population or more changed their vote based on simply watching a video where they got to see the parliamentary candidates debate. So maybe the alternative hypothesis is that people are voting based on ethnicity because they don't have anything else to vote, go on. And we show that there's very, very little information that people have about their candidates. So if you don't know anything else, you might as well vote based on ethnicity. Um, I'm not saying that's the only reason people vote that way, but it does suggest this evidence that we're getting, that others are getting in India, looking at caste-based voting. There's now been uh, replications of this debate study in other African contexts. And you are seeing changes in how people vote when they have more information. The other thing I want to do is pull up some nice statistics that um, the IGC and, and Nicolo, who I, I work with there, um, has done just on, you know, right hot off the press data from this last election in Sierra Leone. And you'll see, so the Northwest, um, the vote share for the APC at the top in the Northwest, and then in the Southeast, which remember is the SLPP stronghold, and then, in, and then for the SLPP again in those two regional strongholds, and how it changes over years. So yes, it is true that the APC always gets a strong vote in the North, but it's not the same over the years. How well they perform does change the percentage of vote that they get. So in 2001, they got 53% in their stronghold area. In 2012, where they really, you know, they won a, a very substantial victory, they got 90% of the vote in their stronghold area. And then in this recent election, where it's been much closer, the, the, the first round is within one percentage point between these two major parties, it's gone down to 70%. So even where you have this eth ethnic voting, you're still getting really quite important rooms for, room for change. And I think that's kind of the margin where there is more competition and people care about policies. In our debate thing, we showed that showing people information moved people more to be based voting based on policies. And so there is room, I'd argue, for kind of te technical things to come in into play. Um, and therefore a role for us in terms of providing advice on, on, on evidence. The other thing I want to say, which I think is really important, is not every single time you give advice is it going to work. Not every time we try and do evidence-based policy is it going to work. But we should think about this work as a portfolio, right? And where you get it, where you win, the wins are so big that it's worth the overall investment. 
So don't come and tell me, oh, well, we've tried five times and four out of the five times it didn't work, therefore evidence-based policy doesn't work. No, because that fifth one may justify all your existence. So this is some work uh, that Michael Kramer did looking at the investments of, uh, of DIV, which is a group within USAID. And with the, because when you look at a portfolio approach, you want to go back and look at every single investment you made um, to then see what are the wins. Because you might argue, I just cherry-picked my wins in the first part of this talk. But this is a serious case of saying, let's look at every investment done over a two-year period and see and estimate the costs and the benefits of those wins. So 43 awards done, and six of those awards reached, got scaled up. So these are you know, investments in evidence-based uh, so you would, you know, make an investment and then do a careful evaluation of where, whether it was effective and if it was effective, scale it up. Um, and so you got six. Oh dear, that's my phone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so, so you got six of these which um, reached over a million people and and just and some of these are harder to quantify the benefits than others. So if we just take the three where it's easier to quantify the benefits, you find that those just looking at the benefits of those three, you have um, you know three dollars of return of social benefits for every one dollar invested. So again, just three justifies the investment in 43 different approaches. So I just, you know, this, you could, Michael could talk about this for an hour, but, you know, the basic point is we've got to think about this in terms of, of a portfolio, and the big wins really justify uh, a lot of investment. So how do we do evidence-based policy? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about substance and style. Uh, about how, you know, I've learned, I've worked in the Treasury, I've worked at J-PAL, I'm now working at DFID, sort of what have I learned about what's an effective way to do it? And also I've thought kind of more conceptually about what's the right way to do it. So I'm going to mix substance and style. So the first thing I think it's really important to understand if you're approaching evidence-based policy is understanding that policymakers are really constrained in cognitive bandwidth, right? So you've got to think, so, so I think thinking using your behavioral economics is quite useful as a strategy for thinking about how to do evidence-based policy. So why do I say it's kind of classic behavioral economics problem? Because it's a, there's a high payoff, of, as we've seen, to doing this right, to getting to technically improving your programs. But there's an upfront cost, and we know that humans are really bad you know, you're saying, well, hang on, I know you've got a program that's all ready to go, but it could be made a bit better if you incorporate this evidence. But there's all these pressures to get the program out the door, to, you know, be on the timeline. So, so you've got to try and introduce some complexity at that point and say, well, how, how, you know, let's review it a bit. So there's a short run cost in terms of, you know, their effort and maybe some money but the gains could be quite substantial, but in the long run, and maybe that policymaker won't be there in the long run. So, so that's, we, that's exactly the trade-off that we find in, in kind of uh, standard behavioral economics. So what do we learn for behavioral economics about how to solve that problem? Well, one is you've got to make it easy and cheap <laughs> to include evidence. Uh, the easier you make it for people to include the evidence, the more likely it is that it's going to be taken up. Maybe that's obvious, but, but it's also important that salience matters. So, you know, we, talk, we often hear people talking about disseminating evidence and, and it, you know, you present it and you've explained it and then you've walked away and why didn't the policymaker do it? I mean, I told it to them once. Well, you know, that's not how human beings work anywhere let alone if you're a harried policymaker. So just presenting it and walking away is not, uh, not going to do, do, you know, make change. And this is what we learned again and again at J-PAL uh, in my work there is, you know, we needed people on the ground working with policymakers day in and day out to, 
you know, to help them. And that's partly a salience thing because it's not just about tell it once and walk away. It's also important, you know, framing matters using their language, not yours. We often, as researchers, talk about things in the way we're used to talking about them instead of putting ourselves in the shoes of the policymakers. So, um, so that's a bit about the style, and I'll come back to the style. But what about the substance? So bring your whole toolbox. You know, when you're trying to solve a policy problem, you need to bring all the tools that you have learned <laughs> and apply them in the right way to the right question. So what are some examples? Well, descriptive data can be extremely powerful in helping you understand a policy problem and also suggestions of, of you know, how to solve it. And I think we underutilize descriptive data. We don't give enough credit for it in, you know, in journals, et cetera. So that little chart you can't see the details of, but is some data that I did during the Ebola crisis in Sierra Leone. You know, I've been working there for many years when the Ebola crisis hit. I had built up a team of local researchers who were very good at collecting data. I wasn't gonna be able to help on the health side. I'm not a health, uh, health specialist, but I know data, right? So what did we do? We turned everyone into collecting data on what was going on on the economics on the ground. And there was a lot of, you know, if you looked at the papers at the time and you looked at the policy discussion, everyone was yelling, food prices are going up, it's a complete disaster, you know, there's the food prices. And we're like, yeah, food prices always go up at this time of year. So we'd actually collected data in the previous years about the cyclicality of food prices before harvest. Anyone working in Africa knows, food prices goes up, there's scarcity, right? And as soon as harvest hits, they come down again. So what we did is just collect data on food prices and show that it was following exactly the same pattern as it had in previous years. So that's not fancy econometrics, it's just descriptive data, but I think it's important. We also showed that there were tail, the tails were fatter. So there were places where you had higher prices and we could tell People, we could tell the aid agencies where those were. So where they, there were some places where the cordons for Ebola were stopping food getting in and you could send food in. Um, so we show, you know, that's, as I say, simple descriptive data, but it showed that the narrative was completely wrong. Another piece of descriptive data I think is really important uh, in changing the narrative was our, was our data on microcredit. One of the main things that came out of our microcredit RCT is that not that many people want to take up microcredit. All the microcredit organizations said that they, they uh, you know, 80% of people take up microcredit. Turns out only 20% of people do. Like, that was probably more important than the whole RCT. Like, that kind of basic descriptive data, it didn't need an RCT, but that basic descriptive data was really important. So, so bring descriptive data, bring theory, so this happens to be a bit of the theory from, you know, the market for lemons. And just that, that having, you know, thinking about asymmetric information, we do, you know, as part of policy all the time, you're thinking, who's got the information? Where's the asymmetric information? When you're designing insurance, you've got to think about it. When you're designing, you know, when uh, Stefan was doing work on, on how do we as DFID interact with our suppliers, the fact that they have information and we don't is really important in deciding how you do that interaction. So, you know, theory is really important uh, to bring to the table when you're thinking about do providing policy advice. Also, of course, you would be surprised if I didn't mention well-identified causal evidence uh, can be really important in understanding the problems, understanding uh, where, where you would want to intervene or you know, what, what kinds of policies work. It's also really important to bring your contextual institutional knowledge. Um, so this is a picture of a clinic, you know, some clinics in Africa. When I've worked both in India and Afro, you know, in the countries I've worked in Africa, so mainly Sierra Leone, an important difference in the rural clinics in India is they're really small and they have one nurse, whereas in most of the places I worked in Africa, they tend to be bigger and have more people. So the substations in India are very, very likely to be closed. 
absenteeism is as high in Sierra Leone as it is in rural Rajasthan, but the clinic isn't closed because there's like five people in the clinic. So, you know, that kind of institutional knowledge helps you think differently about what the problems are. And we don't talk about this enough. Like, good research is really based. You really have to know your context well. It doesn't come out in our academic papers, but a lot of us in this room have spent a lot of time, you know, talking to people, understanding the institutional environments, and it's really critical when you come to, come to give um, advice. So how do you pull all those different tools together to provide good policy advice and bring evidence to bear? This is my framework for doing it. Um, I want to talk you through it because um, I like the framework. I think it can be used in a lot of different contexts. The first thing, when you're working on a policy challenge, the first thing you have to do is understand the local context. What's the problem that's being, that you're facing here? And this is where your dis local descriptive data really comes into play. So understanding, you know, using DHS or, or LSMS or, you know, other data, administrative data, all those local conversations you're having, to really identify what's the problem. So is it really the case that girls aren't showing up during their menstrual cycle? Because otherwise you're solving a problem which isn't actually a problem, which is something we've found a lot. You know, people assume that there are these cultural barriers, but just descriptive data as to whether or not girls are showing up more or less at different times of the month, you know, will tell you whether there actually is a problem or not. Um, so once you understood the problem, you then want to think about generalized lessons of behavior that would be useful to solving that problem. And for that, you need good theory, you need good descriptive data and correlations, a good, cor you know, a good piece of descriptive data that helps you understand the problem would be the poor spend a lot of money on uh, acute health care. They don't spend very much on prevention. Right? That descriptive piece of information tells me a lot about where I might want to intervene and what might be going on in terms of some of the health problems that we're facing. And then, of course, rigorous causally identified studies are really helpful in us understanding what motivates people um, and you know, what kinds of programs work and what nudges people respond to, what, what incentives people respond to. Um, so that's where kind of the rigorous causally identified data comes in. It doesn't help you understand the next part, which is, have I got local capacity to implement a solution? You know, so I'm going to go through some examples, but there's no, you know, a lot of when people talk about does a study go from one context to another, they were actually worried about this, right? Can you actually run this program in this context? Are there, you know, are there staff to be able to do it? Is there, you know, infrastructure to do it? Do the staff show up? All of that is kind of very locally contextual. So using that framework, let's look at a few examples. So this is, this is uh, descriptive data on learning levels in India from a study in India. And it shows the level of learning on one axis and the grade the kid is enrolled in on the other axis. And so if people were learning according to grade, they would be on that blue line, right? So, you know, in sixth grade, they would be testing at sixth grade level. At 10th grade, they would be testing at 10th grade level. All the dots are below the line is the first thing to realize from this data. They get further and further below the line as time goes on. And there's actually, in the red line, is the average improvement over years. So there's very, there is some improvement going on over years, but it's quite low. And, you know, if we look at 10th grade, by 10th grade, nobody is testing anywhere near the 10th grade curriculum. So people are teaching up there, and what the children in the classroom in the 10th grade are everywhere 
you know, ranging, oh, sorry, that's ninth grade. <laughs> Everywhere between seventh and, uh, between third grade and seventh grade. So the kids are between third grade and seventh grade, they're being taught ninth grade curriculum. So there's a huge gap. So this is telling, this, this descriptive data is telling us a lot about what is going wrong in the classrooms. And it's actually repeated in many, many countries we see this. Now, now we link that to what we see from carefully identified causal studies, which show that of all the studies that we looked at on what works in education, the most effective ones are ones that segregate kids by the level of learning. So remedial education was spectacularly effective, tracking uh, children by what they had learned at the beginning of the year was spectacularly effective. Individually paced computer instruction was effective. So all of these things, the most effective changes in pedagogy are all about matching the child to the learning, to the, child, the curricula, to where the child is. Here's another piece of evidence, which also accumulate, you know, it starts to accumulate our our understanding of what's going wrong and what to do about it, which is that providing inputs doesn't work. Just providing additional inputs doesn't do anything. Except providing textbooks improve the le learning of the top 25% of kids in Kenya. Because the top 25% of kids were the only ones who could read the textbook. Right? So... <coughs> This is all consistent. All these different pieces of evidence I'm getting from very different kinds of tools are all telling me the same thing, that the problem is the curricula is here and the kids are here, and the things that work are the ones that match the two. Final piece of evidence on this, computer-assisted learning. The most effective uh, studies on computer-assisted learning are, again, ones that are personalized learning, i.e., the computer is adapting as the child responds. They're adapting and changing the next question based on, uh, based on what they, uh, how the child responded to the previous. So kind of really tailored at, at the micro level uh, to the individual child. So then the last bit of my framework was you've got to take that learning and implement it. So how do you implement those learnings in Zambia? This is something that I worked on uh, quite a lot in the last couple of years. Zambia has a problem, kids in school not achieving as much as they would like. They were puzzling, how do we do catch up? And this is someone from the uh, education ministry in Zambia going to India and learning about their remedial assistance program and then they had to tailor it and figure out how to, would they implement that in Zambia. And there's a big piloting phase of figuring out how to tailor that. You know, did you do it in the summer? Did you do it after school? All those individual decisions are going to be a Zambia-specific uh, decision. Okay, here's another example of how you would apply that kind of framework thinking to applying evidence uh, to policy. These are slightly... Um, uh, they're roughly northern Nigeria and roughly Sierra Leone, but I've changed the numbers a little bit to make it kind of more obvious. So country, these, this is the immunization schedule and the immunization rate for the different immunizations through the schedule. In country one, you have what is the most common problem in immunization, which is you start high and it falls off over time. In country two, it starts low, and, but there's persistence of those who did that's a two really different problems, and you've got to address them really differently. One is about persistence, and the other is about access, because people aren't even accessing the first immunization in some parts of the world. Most parts of the world, everyone gets the first shot, people don't persist to the end. So what does our theory tell us about why that might be the case, and what does our causally, good causal identified studies show us about what that might be the case? Well, this was a study that we did to exactly try and understand why you would get that pattern. This was in rural Rajasthan, and we showed um, in some communities, we simply fix supply. So this is a place where the, you know, the nurse is hardly ever there. 40% of the, 
of the time, the nurse isn't, isn't there, so it's very hard to get your shot. You walk a long way, you get to the sub-centre, there's nobody there. So simply fixing supply so that absolutely, without fail, there will be a nurse once a month at this point, come and get your kid immunised. That is the yellow chart. The blue is that plus a small incentive. And you can see that classically, even in this area with desperately low immunization rates, when you talk to people, everyone said, oh, it's cultural. Nobody wants to get immunized here. Well, yeah, but 50% of them are getting the first shot. The problem is they're not persisting. So it's not really that they're so anti-immunization. And if you make it predictable, that went up to 78% of people got the first immunization. But they tailed off. Absolutely classic lack of persistence. It's not that you don't want to do it, you, you, you just kind of can't get your act together to keep doing it. The incentive, however, was very effective, didn't change whether you got the first shot, it was very effective at getting people to persist. Um, so that by the end you got a dramatic change in the level of, of immunizations. Now, you know, when I was asked to give advice in Sierra Leone about how to improve immunizations post Ebola, I said, well, you should do this. You should provide incentives. Well, was I mad? This was a study with an NGO in, in, um, in India, and I was talking about West African country and the government. Like, it was completely different. How on earth could I believe that? Well, because it wasn't just that study, there's a huge amount of evidence that people respond to incentives including incentives about immunization, you know, over 30 RCTs on conditional cash transfers. Now, those are big incentives, and I was talking about small incentives. Well, there's another study showing that the size of incentive doesn't matter that much. And there's a bunch of studies looking at incentives, but not about immunization. So we need to stop compartmentalizing our evidence into little bins and learning from all of it, because all of this is relevant to me giving advice in Sierra Leone, that people respond to incentives, that small nudges can have big effects, that yes, people do respond and, and get, get more immunizations if they get paid for it. Final bit of evidence for why I'm not crazy to give this advice in Sierra Leone, even though there's been only one RCT at this point, is this graph. This is the, the demand curve for preventative health goods, a whole bunch of different preventative health goods in a whole bunch of different countries, and you get very, very similar things. So you probably can't see, but the axis at the bottom is the price goes from zero to $2. And on the other axis, you've got take up, and goes from zero to one. So if you give things away for free, you get very, very high take up, small changes in price, and it dramatically falls. Well, that's not an incentive but it's a change in cost, and an incentive is just the negative part of that chart, right? <laughs> so if people are price sensitive, they should also be incentive sensitive, right? Because we're economists and we think in theories, and you know those things are two sides of the same coin. So this is relevant for my advice in Sierra Leone too. And it all is consistent with this you know, behavioral theory that we're really bad at doing things that have a small cost now and a long run gain over time. And it, if we think about that, we don't understand why people aren't. This is what immunizations are. I've got a screaming kid today, I've got a walk in the sun today, and the benefit is hard to distinguish and it, it's over a long period of time. And, but it's huge. And if you think about that from a classic standard economics perspective, you wouldn't understand why no, anyone would not get them, their kid immunized. But if we think about it as a trade-off between getting them immunized today versus an immunized tomorrow, rather than do I get my kid immunized or not, then you always put it off to tomorrow because the cost is today and the benefit is a long run. Um, so as soon as you think about that, that people are present biased and they're focusing on the short run, it makes total sense that they're not getting their kid immunized because they keep putting it off for till tomorrow, which is exactly what I did with my kids until I got a threatening letter from the daycare saying, if your kid isn't immunized, they won't 
be able to come to daycare next week. Now, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I believe in immunization. I wrote a book on immunizations. <laughs> I did study immunization. I still couldn't get my act together to get my kid immunized because I needed a nudge, uh, which we do all the time in the, in the rich world. So, so that's kind of all the theory that goes behind thinking that this is the right thing to do. Um, but the implementation is going to vary a lot. How you do this is going to vary by context. Right? So these are the current ways that we're thinking about it across the world. So in Kenya, there's been a nice study using doing small incentives for immunization using M-Pesa. So if you go uh, and get your kid immunized, you get a little bit of uh, you get, get a little transfer on M-Pesa. Great, because M-Pesa works high coverage in Kenya, got a nice study that's published in uh, Lancet Global Health showing that that's effective. But you know what? Elsewhere, including Pakistan, where I tried to do the equivalent using uh, mobile money in Pakistan, turns out only about 30% of people are able to encash the money that we sent in our pilot when they got in immunized. So we switched to using top-ups. So you have to vary it. You know, it's not the equivalent of M-Pesa is just not working anything like as effectively in Pakistan. So we have to go with a different approach. So we're doing mobile top-ups, um, and, and they're also piloting that in Haryana in, uh, and studying that in Haryana in India. In Sierra Leone, we can't even do top-ups because a lot of people don't have, don't have cell phones, um, uh, and you know, maybe that will change, but there we're trying uh, Plumpy Nut. And again, so that, you know, very different implementation strategies depending on the local context. So in sum, evidence-based policy is not about this, i.e. one study that shows, you know, the effect of immunization incentives and had a result and we should do it elsewhere. It's not about that, it's about this. Right? And this is more general. You shouldn't be thinking about your evidence in little compartmentalized boxes. You have to bring it all together into an overall theory of what, people, what changes people's behavior and use that. So I think there are a bunch of implications for researchers for thinking about evidence-based policy in this different way. The first is, don't do this, right? <laughs> So, or at least that's only part of the story. Policy dissemination is not about standing in front of an audience, giving a presentation and walking away. That's not going to change anybody's policy. This is a little bit better. This is me at a workshop in Bangladesh talking about our results um, with my co-author, with my Bangladeshi co-author, who now sits <laughs> on the Committee for Youth Policy in Bangladesh. So that's really where it starts to happen. That is what evidence-based policy looks like. It's sitting down with the policymakers, going through the data, talking it through, understanding their problems, and figuring out how all your toolbox can be used to help them solve their problem. So you need to research the problem, understand the problem. You need to listen to what the policymaker's problem is. You need to find an overlap between what the evidence says and their problem. Because there are lots of places where they have a problem and you don't really have any evidence, which is hard. But what you're looking for is where there's an overlap of good evidence and a problem that they're facing. And then you've got to think about how to frame um, how, you, you know, how you present the evidence. And again, trying to use as much of their language uh, and less of yours. There's another implication about how we summarize evidence. This is a pet peeve of mine. I really don't like systematic reviews that count the number of studies that had positive statistically significant effects. I think that's a really bad way. That can be part of what you do, but it can't be mainly what you do. Because you can have 
you know, it can be not significant because you've got a big standard error, or it could be not significant because you've got a really tight standard error and very precise zero. Um, and more importantly, if you think back to all the different studies I pulled on to, in that immunization example, they wouldn't all be in the same box in a systematic review, right? I talked about price sensitivity and immunization incentives, and not all of the studies I draw, drew on were about immunization. So if you just do like a little grid of how many studies are there that have shown a positive impact for immunize, small immunization incentives, when I first gave that advice, I, they would have said one, and now they would say two, but that massively underestimates the amount of evidence there was behind that advice because it came from many different sources. And we've got to really think about being Bayesians and you know, pulling our information from many different sources. So that's why I worry about systematic reviews that kind of don't pull in all the different kinds of information. Instead, what I like are theory-based evidence reviews, which is saying, what's the theory behind there and what's the evidence for that theory? It can be descriptive evidence that people don't spend on preventative health. It could be evidence from the price sensitivity. You know, it could be evidence from RCTs. I want all of that information to be brought together to understand, to understand the problem. So more of those kind of overviews that bring together lots of different information and try and come up with generalizable results. Um, by the way, if you don't think that the, anything generalizes, you're in the wrong business. Because our job as social scientists is to understand what is, the, what is generalizable from all the things that we all the evidence that we have. What is the common driver of behavior that we're observing? So simply to say everything is different in every different context, you're not doing your job. Because the definition of research is producing knowledge that is general. That is the definition of research. Producing knowledge that provides a general, uh, you know, a generalizable lesson. Go look it up in the human subjects when you need, you know, that's why we have to get, uh, you know, what defines whether we're doing research or somebody is doing consulting is that we're producing generalizable knowledge. So we got to be in the job of trying to understand what is common behind all the things that we are, that we're learning. What is common across different cultures. So another implication is I think our debate about external validity is completely confused. So whenever anyone asks me, and they always ask me, does this result generalize, they're really asking three very different questions. One is, is this a problem that is also found elsewhere? The second is, does the underlying behavior that you're trying to test generalize to other situations? And the third is, can the policy that you're talking about or the specific intervention be replicated elsewhere because of institutional, you know, because of sort of implementation challenges? So do you want to do M-Pesa or do you want to do Plumpy Nuts, right? Those things, that's a very different question from do people respond to small incent, do people change the, uh, you know, the demand for immunization with a small incentive. How you incentivize them may be really different. Whether they are price sensitive over preventative health is a general question. So, you know, really try and be specific about which of those three questions you're asking. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna end with um, some, some advice I gave a long time ago, but seems to get a lot of, um, coverage and people find quite useful, and I think is also related to the discussion we've been having, which is for people who might be interested in moving, as I have done, from research into policy. I've gone backwards and forwards. Um, and it was advice I first gave to MIT graduate students who were thinking about going into policy. And I said, A, you get 
told by your PhD supervisors um, who are very snobby about policy, and they say, you know, oh, policy is just for the people who can't hack in an academia. And, um, you know, and I've had colleagues of mine at MIT say some pretty outrageous things to me uh, along these lines. And they also judge, think they understand what being a policymaker is. And none of them have ever been a policymaker, so they don't know. So I thought it would be useful to give, so my, it's, one isn't better than the other, they're just different, right? So this is why they're different and the different kinds of people and characteristics for these two different kinds of work. So researchers need to answer, um, oh, sorry, this is, I'm talking about this slide. I'll get back to the other slide in a minute. Um, so, in academia, you have long deadlines. You need to be self-motivated. Whereas in policy, you have short deadlines and you have to be good at working in teams. In academia, it's important to be novel. In policy, you better get it right because actual lives are at stake. Um, and by which I mean, and this is often misunderstood, but what I mean by novel is you, there's a lot to be said for, you know, you get a lot of credence for being the first person to show it. You know, or your result is different. You're always showing how your result is different from other people's. Whereas in policy, it's good to kind of do the thing that there's a lot of consensus about. Um, in academia, you're often worried about the direction of effect, where, um, by which I mean, you know, does, does monetary policy have an effect on the real economy? Well, you know, in policy, we've gone past that. <laughs> like, yes, what should the interest rate be? Um, and, you know, similarly, does the fiscal deficit have an effect? Yeah, but should it be 3% or 4%? Um, in academia, you're convincing economists. In policy, you're convincing non-economists. And this is the thing that I think is most important. In academia, you've got to answer a question well. And in policy, you've got to answer the question you're given as well as you can in the time that you have. So when I first started encountering PhD students who were asking, you know, oh dear, what, you know, what question should I work on? I thought, seriously? I get five questions on my desk every morning. Um, so, again, become an expert on one issue as opposed to trying to apply your tools to many different contexts and, and problems. Academia, find the optimal policy, you know, find the optimal within constraints. Let me go back to this question, which is, as a researcher wanting to work with policymakers, say doing research, doing, you know, doing research embedded in a government agency or trying to persuade a government agency to randomize. So as a researcher going into that, how do you make yourself attractive to the policymakers? Well, you want to answer the questions they care about. You've got to be flexible. You can't, if you go in there saying, this is what I want to randomize, that's it, this is, this is my plan, you're, you're going to end up in heartache. Um, and so you've got to think about, you know, you could, never, ever has my research design survived the conversations with the policymaker. I've always ended up with something different than I first went in with. Normally better. But if you go in thinking this is it and I'm not going to do anything different, that's, that's going to be a problem. Sharing your expertise is really important. You have lots of expertise from knowing how Stata works to being able to produce a nice data visualization. All of these things are incredibly valuable to the policymakers you're working with and can buy you unbelievable amounts of goodwill. Just taking that baseline data and Showing, some, showing a correlation or showing the coverage in different areas that they really want, that, that's really useful to them, buys you all sorts of political goodwill that allows you to then do some cool things. Um, provide intermediate inputs. You know, our papers come out, when our papers are published, nobody is left in the implementation team. You've got to give them something before that. Um, have a local presence and keep it frequent. You've got to keep talking to people. You, again, you don't, we had someone at a, a course once who came and said, well, I set up the RCT, I went away, I came back a year later, and they hadn't followed it. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, 
they're hitting problems all the time, and you need to be there to help them solve those problems and maintain the research design, right? When you're looking for policy partners to work with, what should you look for? People who work at sufficient scale, I can't tell you the number of times people have wanted to work with me and it turns out they're working in one village or one school, right? That normally rules out like 80% of the people who want to work with you. That they're flexible. Yes, you've got to be flexible. Well, they've got to be flexible too. Um, they've got to be willing, you know, somebody has just got, this is the thing that they do. I, there's no way around it. It's just not going to be a good partnership. Ideally, they're, represent, they're implementing a kind of relatively representative program. So when we did our study on microcredit, on an RCT of microcredit, we actually spent about four years or more looking for the right partner to do that with. They had to be willing to evaluate. They had to believe that it was useful to find out their effect. And they had to, and we wanted someone who was doing kind of reasonably standard product so that it might be relevant to other people. You want local expertise. They're really the ones who are going to tell you whether this is going to go down well in the local community, how to frame things so that it doesn't upset the local community. Uh, you know, really that institutional knowledge that's so vital to developing good research. You need some, I mean, yes, you should get as much as, as you can, but you need a partner who really knows that stuff well. Low staff turnover. This is one of the reasons why working with NGOs is better than working with governments, is the government turnover is so high. Uh, and it's just a challenge um, if, you know, you've got everyone excited about doing research with you, and then they all leave. <laughs> How many of us have been there? Um, and then finally, they have to care about knowing the truth. Um, in our book, we quote uh, Rukmini Banerjee, um, who we had spent you know, a year with Pratam on the ground developing a new program. And when she trained her staff to launch that program, she started with this inspiring speech about how they, you know, hoped they were going to change the lives of these kids who weren't learning in school. And she said, but you know what? And, and there are these people from MIT who are going to help you evaluate this. And you know what? They may find that what we're doing doesn't work. But we need to know that. Because if we don't know that, if we go ahead without that, we're wasting their time, we're wasting our time, but more importantly, we're wasting the time of the people we're working with, we're wasting the time of the kids. We need to know that, because if it doesn't work, we're going to go on and build something even better that does. So that's your ideal partner, is someone who wants to learn with you. Um, okay, and on that. So I'm going to end with an ask of the researchers in the room which is there's an unbelievable return to doing high-quality policy-relevant research that speaks both to theory. And remember, when I'm saying policy-relevant, that means theory-driven, because the more theory-driven it is, this sounds ironic, right? Policy-relevant means theory-based, because the more theoretically grounded your research, the more likely it is to generalize, because you're testing an underlying behavior that will then generalize. So policy relevant, theory driven, uh, that engages with the details. You can't do development work without engaging with the details. So you might have seen um, Astor's paper and presentation at, at um, the American Economic Association uh, on Economist as Plumber, which is all about, you've got to worry about the details. When you're discussing your results with policymakers, try and see their perspective, understand their interests, use their language, and talk about the body of research, not just about your study. This is so hard when I try and get people <laughs> to talk to policymakers. They just want to talk about their study. What's most useful for the policymakers is to understand how that study fits in the body of research. And really well written synthesis of the implications of a body of research that brings out these underlying commonalities of behavior and therefore the things that will replicate in other contexts. That's really what we need. That's the powerful thing that we need within governments to be able to design the next policy. Not, you know, that old, you know, not this 
not this. I want you to present this, right? Because this is just one study in isolation. We need this. We need, you know, and particularly from, from academics, we need that blue thing, which is the general lessons of behavior synthesized from a whole body of different kinds of tools, because then we can apply that well in different contexts. So that's what we need from, uh, from policy make, from, from the research community, that kind of general synthesis in accessible language. And I know that's a big ask, but if you, you know, we started with why do this work and the results are, the reason is because it's big. You know, if we're not bringing evidence to policy, what the hell are we doing here? Thanks. Thank you, Rachel, for, um, for, for an excellent um, uh, talk. And I'm sure there's uh, lots of people that want to ask questions. Um, I'm just looking in the room. Um, let me collect three. Maybe state your name briefly, your affiliation, and uh, quick questions. And the roving microphones are coming down there. This one here as well. This. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm Jean-Christophe. I study here. I'm playing at home. Um, thank you so much for the, the wonderful lecture. Um, so every now and then on uh, Evidence Economics Twitter, there's an outburst of interest for uh, null results, for pre-analysis plans, and I, I was very curious about what you think, if you think there's enough momentum with what's going on right now with the Journal of Development Economics and the uh, pre-data um, pre, uh, review policy that they've, they've introduced. Um, about uh, Abadi's paper on, on the importance of null results as opposed to just counting stars, and I'd, I'd be very interested in, in knowing what you think about this. Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Leandro uh, de Magalhães from the University of Bristol. I think it's related. So, uh, in terms of, of experience with policymakers, what we, we talked mostly about implementing new policies. What about saying this policy doesn't work? Should we just stop? Does that work? Have you had experience with that? I think it's related to no results and thank you. Is there one more? Otherwise, why don't you take this, Rachel? No, there's one more. Oh, there's one more behind. behind. Sorry, I didn't see. Anke Hoefler, CSAE. Um, so, ter terrifically inspiring talk. Um, so, you put quite rightly a lot of emphasis on rigorously identified data um, challenges. And also, you talked about um, academics asking questions that we can answer. And I think a lot of academics limit themselves to exactly that. What can I answer? And can I identify in the sort of, you know, how it's currently understood in the paper? Because I want to publish a paper. But it then ends up being relatively small compartmentalized problems, which you exactly said we shouldn't have, yeah? We shouldn't compartmentalize. So how do we get beyond this sort of selection effect that I um, see? Because your examples were basically all on health and education. I can see how this works, but it doesn't work for, for other also very important development challenges. We have one more, just two people, just behind that. Thanks very much, Rachel. Um, so one thing you started with was the importance of immersion in the local context to really understand what's going on. And I think when people are, have a lot of time, you're a PhD student, you stay there for months, you live there, you really understand it. And I think for those of us that are transitioning now, <laughs> Um, having lots of other responsibilities. How do you think this is still able to work for people who have to teach or who have other things where you don't have that um, ability? And um, one model I think that happens is graduate students are there, but I think there's a lot that people learn by being there yourself, things you might pick up on where your student might not be able to, so really would love advice on, on that. Great, thanks for all the, all the good questions. Um, Null results, um, that is a um, <laughs> very dear to my heart. Um, we had a uh, null result um, on the institutional effects of community-driven development, 
uh, which is something that you know, various estimates have suggested a quarter or more of the World Bank's funding goes on community-driven development. Um, you know, we submitted it to a journal and basically got the referee report back saying, you know, I, we know that we're not meant to say it's not interesting if you get a null result, but, um, you know, yes, it's a really important program. We can't find anything wrong in what you've done, but, you know, it's a small African country and it's CDD. I mean, literally. <laughs> so we ended up rewriting it as a paper about the importance of pre-analysis plans, and it got published in a top five journal. <laughs> You're like, come on, guys. This was a null result for a really important kinds of project. But yeah, so though partly the advice is, you know, have Ted Miguel as a co-author who's very good at figuring out politically uh, what's going to sell. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, in fact, I think there's some, some the, there's been some, you know, Twitter and blog coverage of kind of how people have sold different null results and um, as methodological contributions. Um, so yes, so it's quite interesting to see the the general development economics go this way of saying, you know, this is a sufficiently important uh, uh, project. We'll promise to publish it. Um, even if you don't get, um, you know, if, whatever the results are. <clears throat> the, I mean, I have heard pushback to that perspective, which is that there are a lot of things which you, you don't, you, you know, you don't know until, excuse me. <coughs> you don't know whether it's going to be an interesting paper until you see the results and some things you know, it might be an obscure program which is only interesting if you get a positive result. So there has been some discussion about, so I think we're never gonna go to a full, fully based system where all papers are accepted before you know the results. Um, but I, I don't think we fully, I, do, I still think it's hard to get, to get null results published and that's wrong and I'm not completely convinced of that, you know, this pre-publication is gonna solve it all, but it's maybe a step in the right direction. Um, how do we stop, um, how do we, you know, are we doing enough to stop programs that don't work? Um, I've been asked that I think maybe 16 times since I arrived at DFID is can you tell me something to stop doing? <laughs> um, it's actually, you know, it's really hard to do that because, um, you know, we keep thinking, well, maybe there's, you know, a better way to design it. I mean, Louise has got this, these, all this, this paper on kind of how training um, program, a lot of training programs don't work. And, you know, I, I was talking to colleagues working this area saying, so, so can we just say that, you know, we should not do training programs? Can we just stop with the training programs? Got a lot of pushback from academics working in the area saying, no, 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 we, we just got to figure out a better way of doing it. We can't kind of leave these people without a program. So, so I think, again, as a community, we're kind of not very good at, at saying, no, you know, we're, the evidence is, is not really very promising at this point. Um, and we should just stop it until, you know, maybe continue to do small research projects, but, but you know, stop it as a big funder. Um, small compartmentalized studies. So A, partly the examples are on education and health, because that's the last couple of years, I, that's what I've worked on a lot. Um, and although, also I would say in the area of, I've also done quite a bit of work on the governance area and this politics stuff, um, and there again, I think, across very different contexts what, and very different programs, you're still getting this underlying finding that people's voting behavior is much more flexible than some of our standard models of politics would suggest. So that's at least you know, another example outside of education and health. Um, so I think, so what I would say is you can do small studies as in small geographic studies, and they may look to be on very specific programs. What you need to do is be testing a more general theory. So it's not about how big your sample size is, it's about how general the point is that you're trying to test. So what I would advise against is testing something that you know is not 
doesn't tease out the mechanism. I, you know, it's a program with 15 different elements and you can't really, you don't really know what the mechanism is behind it. It's that, it's not, when you say, unless it's, you know, a big program that, like CDD is a bit like that. It has many different elements, but it kind of a huge amount of money is going behind it. But it can be small and asking, asking about a relatively small program, but being designed well to answer that more fundamental question. Like, you know, Pascaline and Jessica's paper on pricing of bed nets, you know, was small geographically, it was small in the number of people, but it was asking a fundamental question, which is, is the take up, do, do you not hang a bed net if you've got it for free? Are people, you know, does whether you pay for something change your willingness to use it? That is a very general question. So that, that's, uh, and you know, I'm not gonna come up with all the examples in non-health and education and governance areas of that, but I, there are the equivalents in all sectors of those kinds of questions. So there could be well-identified causal studies, but of a common, you know, of a really important underlying behavioral. So Oebolia's question about spending time on the ground. Um, yeah, I mean, then this is why you see this huge persistence in, in where people work. So, you know, people keep working in the place where they did their PhD thesis. So, you know, all of you are about to start your PhD thesis. There's a huge persistence in that because that's when you get to really understand. And, you know, sometimes I think, I've put a huge amount of capital into learning all the institutional details of a country of seven million people. <laughs> but that's sort of, you know, once you've learned that, you've built the relationships that allow you to test some really cool things. Um, so it is hard, but maybe, you know, you use your sabbatical or your, and you work with co-authors is the other thing who can, you know, your junior co-authors who can spend a huge amount of time and build up the relationships, I think is, is the other way. Okay, some more questions. Ooh, lots of hands suddenly. Um, well, let's let's go find, find find the front here, and then we'll take some at the back there. Uh, thank you. I just want to ask: Do you think that the culture and incentives in academic economics rewards people for being good at engaging with policymakers? For good at. Do the, yeah, does it does it reward people for being good at this kind of thing? Albert Zufak, Chief Economist for Africa at World Bank. Thank you very much, Rachel, for a great lecture. Uh, two points. One, on uh, policy engagement. I completely agree with you. We need to move away from the traditional dissemination, which is a one-off event, and move towards uh, multi-product and uh, tailor-made outputs. The question is, how do you change the incentive of researchers to move towards that new delivery mode? Because for most of the researchers, the ultimate prize is to get that paper in a year and you know, modify that coefficient at the margin and get to that next level of publication. How do you change the incentive in the research community? Yep. Second, um, I think your framework is actually very, very useful because it can actually help us rethink the way we do capacity building in countries. Because you know, it's critical to have communities within governments who see exactly along the same lines to help us actually implement those and to transform those ideas into policies. There are some initiatives that we are starting at the World Bank Africa region trying to create those institutions within government to help this. And, and I think without those, it's gonna be extremely difficult for us researchers to fly in and despite all our efforts, make that happen. Thank you. And one behind there. And then we're going to go very much at the back there. Hi, uh, Karan Nakpal, University of Oxford. Uh, Rachel, you have now here. <laughs> I know you said at the back. So. <laughs> Next time, after that. Uh, you have now, you have obviously worked very closely with developing country policymakers in your work in Africa and South Asia, uh, in JPAL. Now you're working in a developed country with developed country policymakers. How are these two groups different, and how do you adapt your strategies to dealing with these two groups? 
Thanks, Rachel. My name is Martha. I'm from IDRC, and uh, thanks for a terrific presentation. Um, my first question was uh, regarding the incentives. So a lot of times, the kind of research questions that lend itself to policy relevant are not necessarily the type that um, top journals would pick. So like, how, what, what do we do to change in the incentives um, in terms of avenues for researchers also um, get incentivized and um, other channels for publishing um, their, their work. But my, my second question is around capacity. So we, like even in IDRC, we come across a lot of times when we work with researchers that they say, we know we're very good in generating the evidence, but we may not have the capacity to either communicate it in, in, in the way that non-research community can, in a way that you describe it, or may not have a rapport with a policy makers. So, what advice would you give to researchers that feel that, you know, I, my role is really a generating research, but I really am out of my, my depth in, te in terms of making that connection effectively for various reasons? Is it like working in teams? Um, what role for the, the, the sort of communication um, intermediaries, for example? Okay, great. So um, a lot of questions about incentives there. Um, so rewards for communication, it's interesting because I, I'm often puzzled about this because some of the same people who are kind of quite snooty about policy work um, tend to get excited and you know proud of their colleagues who get on the front page of the New York Times or, and you're like, yeah, actually, when you do policy, you're doing much more having, and they're inter they're excited about that because they think, oh, it's going to change policy. Whereas actually, their graduate student who went into the ministry is actually having much more policy impact than their star academic colleague who got on the front page of the New York Times. So there's this little bit of kind of, um, you know, that doesn't add up in people's response. So there is some academic credibility that is given to be or people are seen as kind of famous because they're on the telly all the time uh, and yet the you know and yet the so I, I you know sometimes I kind of want to point that out to them but um, so I think it's not that it's not that we as you know that academics don't value the policy we it's it's a slightly bad measure we use a slightly inappropriate measure of that you know people are valued for being you know being seen as experts and being on the telly all the time. And you, you need to explain that that's not actually a good indicator of policy influence. Um, so the, so the, the incentive for actually having those deep conversations, I mean, a very practical incentive actually, is that if you want to do really cool stuff in these, you know, do really cool research designs, building up those relationships is really invaluable. So in, in this last election in Sierra Leone, we managed to persuade the political parties um, to randomize where they did primaries. So you don't do that kind of thing unless you have spent the last 15 years being, you know, building up a reputation for someone. So, you know, literally we, and this was mainly my colleague, not mine, my influence, but you know, she's worked there a long time. Uh, Kate Casey, and she's you know, everyone knows her. Quite a lot of people know me too, but they've so you know, we were introduced to the flag bearers as by people who we'd worked with saying, Look, this is someone you can trust, and and so we persuaded them to do some really interesting stuff because it, so that's really the incentive. We, it's, you know, these deep relationships are the ones that get really important results. Now, that's only, that's only dissemination in the country where you're working. We actually need to care about the dissemination to other countries, because if we only affect, so there's a narrative which is we have a lot of, which I've heard at the World Bank, which is, you know, we have a lot of effect through the projects that we do research on. Well, yeah, but kind of that's not enough. We need to influence a lot of other countries. And I think that also relates to your incentive question, which is coming back to the thing that's really important is the synthesis of all the different research. So yes, an individual researcher may not be so good at disseminating their study, but you know what? That's not the main effect that 
policy effect. The main policy effect is when we bring all of these studies together and understand the world differently as a result of this whole body of research. And then we need to be going out and bringing that body of research um, out. And the thing that slightly frustrates me is that's a difficult thing to do well. And it needs really good researchers who really understand the evidence to do that well. And it's not, you know, excuse me, the, you know, consultants who do that, right? And we need the top academics and the people who've really thought about the theory. And this is what you do. This is your job to understand your sector. It's your job when you teach to understand all of the research in your sector and understand and be able to explain to your students how it all fits together, what it means for the theory, how you change your ideas of the theory based on all this evidence. We just need that downloading of your brain in the different areas and I can do it in health and education because I've been thinking about that for many years and how does it all fit together I need other people in the other sectors to be doing that in their other sectors and kind of bringing it all together into a coherent piece of you know and then I need it in two pages please um, yeah so that's your job. But it's not every individual academic. We've got to get away from thinking about the dissemination that way. It's the body of evidence that matters. Uh, and then we need the incentives for that. Um, but, you know, DFID's funds, like most of the research in this, a lot of the good research that we've been talking about. So, you know, I, I've said to the research community, you know, they said, well, we're trying to get our people to, you know, do those synthesis. I'm like, look, given the amount of money we've been doing, we really ought to just like you ought to deliver that to us so uh, I think the academic community owes it to DFID um, so so then there was one in the middle I can't read my writing now oh yeah how is it different for policymakers you know working with policymakers from develop versus uh, developing countries so a lot of the things are actually the same in that there, you know, this kind of cognitive bandwidth, I've got to, you know, I've got to cope with the short-term crisis. Um, that's a challenge everywhere for policymakers. And so making it easy and convenient and working with their, how they're thinking um, is actually all very, very similar, I would say. For, so, you know, phrasing, putting it, put, seeing yourself in their shoes, what are they worried about? What's the overlap between the evidence, you know, what the evidence is and the problems they're facing and make it easier, f easy for them to uptake by saying, how do we translate this into what it, what does this evidence actually mean for what they do differently tomorrow? That's what we need to be doing because then that's helpful and that's much easier for them to take it on board. Um, you know, there's kind of minor differences about whether I can assume that they've read certain things or not or use certain language. But the main idea of, I need to put it in their language and their perspective is the same. Okay, very quickly, two more questions. Ooh, it's hands going up. There was one there at the back. Yeah. Hi, thank, thank, you for, um, thank you for your wonderful presentation. I'm uh, Atika from the University of Mannheim. Um, so this might be betraying the entire economic uh, community, <laughs> <laughs> but very often, we, um, we focus entirely on quantitative evidence and there is no focus on qualitative evidence. And recently I feel that lots of donors and lots of governments are asking us to um, design experiments with some sort of qualitative evidence within. Um, so what is your opinion on that? Okay. Thanks. And then finally. Uh, um, hi, I'm Sebastian from the Junior Graduate Institute. I wanted to ask you about how you think it is we can best bring this evidence in in developing countries. And given your background, I think I I assume your position on that. But I'm ex especially interested in sort of the trade-off between investing in RCTs versus investing in better public data like household panel surveys or so. And there, there are, of course, all these dimensions in which the two approaches differ. There's causal identification, external validity, treatment heterogeneity, understanding the mechanisms, and, of course, all this reproducibility and accessibility of data issues, and, of course, also the issue of, of building national statistical capacity and actually bringing policymakers closer to the data. Because um, 
I, I'm, I, maybe I'm, char uh, I'm drawing a, char a character, but um, and my impression is that there's a lot of randomization going on in developing countries, especially in Africa, but that few of that sort of gets into policy and that public data is still pretty bad and that a lot of policymakers are very skeptical about these results. So, so I just want to ask you, what do you see the optimal way forward in the African context? Where should we invest? <laughs> so, um, okay. So I could talk for an hour actually about the qualitative thing. I put, um, recently concluded a big project um, working closely and I've had really good experiences and really bad experiences. Uh, my very short takeaway is you need trust between the qualitative and quantitative. So where it's worked well for me, Bang Bangladesh, you, you know, you saw my co-author, she's a qualitative researcher. Uh, we worked together for seven years. We know what the other one's strengths are. The second thing is don't use the qualitative to answer a quantitative question and vice versa. You get that all the time. They are not going to be able to explain the difference between treatment and control. Their number of, their number of units are too small. You can't do a representative sample. It doesn't work with qualitative. Or you can do it, but... And the other thing is you need to be talking to each other. So, you know, the kinds of things we learned from that qualitative work was... Often I was in the qualitative interviews, not always by any means, but I was in a lot of, you know, quite a few of them. And it told me a lot about mechanisms in a way that the qualitative researcher wouldn't necessarily have been able to articulate because I was hearing these conversations. I'm thinking, whoa, she just said signaling. Like, we've got to think about signaling. We, you know, this is a search model. This is a really thin market. You know, these are all the things that it could, and that's not what she's thinking. So it's, the, it's our constant conversations about what she's hearing, and then I putting it into my frameworks um, and vice versa. And that, so that's why the trust needs to happen. Um, but it's not about... Uh, you know, whereas other people have done qualitative work where they do a qualitative, you know, interview in my treatment area, qualitative in my control, and they say, look, you didn't find a difference, but we did. I'm like, yeah, but you, no. Leave the, co leave the causal identification to me, and you tell me things that I can't answer with my data. Don't try and answer the same question, answer different questions. So, short summary of how it works. Um, Data versus RT RCTs, where do we invest? So I can't tell you, you know, X percent should go on this. I'm absolutely passionate about descriptive data. You know, see my talk. Um, I think it's really important for understanding the problems and where we learn is where we bring all these different tools. So we absolutely need good nationally representative descriptive data to understand what the hell the problems are that we might then use an RCT to look at different options. So, so you, you know, it's really about bringing them together and you've got to look at what's the challenge in the particular country that you're facing. Is it that you don't have descriptive data or have you got descriptive data and you've got lots of programs but you don't know which one's working? So it's not, there's not a set percentage, it's you know, in some places, you might have lots of RCTs but no descriptive data and vice versa. So you've got to, you've got to again, it's what's the problem you're facing and what's the right tool to, to answer that problem. Okay, well, it, it leads me just to close the session and, um, and, and thanking Rachel uh, for, you know, the passion and commitment you're showing to bringing data and evidence into policy making. And uh, I think, uh, you know, it should be an inspiration to all of us and uh, many of the things you said, you know, Let's let's keep on uh, keep the, keep keep fighting for the cause here, and uh, <laughs> let's show show uh, our appreciation for her today. Thank you.